Mr. Twinkle here chiming in that if you are to go and play If Underfell now at present, the voices you hear here are no longer currently available in the game. They were removed for very clear reasons and very justified reasons, but we're not going to talk about that. Uh, I also like to admit that part of the footage did get corrupted, so I had to go back and re-record it. And I'm so sorry this was delayed. Better late than never. Either way, 10 likes in this video and I will bring you another If episode. Make sure to hit that girl. And then you'll get it sooner. And remember, there's only one person doing everything, so now back to past Twinkle. I'm so sorry this was so delayed. Trust me, I am so relieved to finally get this up. Hello, my little stars, and here we are back again with another If Underfell episode. Today we're going to be tackling the Papyrus Romance route, which has some voice acting. Now I need to clarify to everyone out there that seems to always get this confused. It at no point stated that it was fully voice acted. It, technically, the post should have said partially voice acted because only certain lines actually get voiced by said characters. Um, from what I can gather, it's like the first time the character talks or whenever there's like a wall of text with only like one line of dialogue for them to like say and they'll read that. And of course, it's whenever you lose in battle and during the fights they talk. Now, since Gaster, you don't fight him, he only got the one line, bless his little soul. Now, in terms of who got the most, I believe it's Sans, and then it's Papyrus, and then it's Asgore. But I'm not here to romance goat, so he can forget about it. Today we're going to go after the last um, route that has voicing, which is Papyrus. I will, of course, focus on scenes where Papyrus appears, and I may cut out certain scenes um, I don't know yet. And then we've only got one other route we need to go down quickly to get the bonus, which is Ezreal, because he got a new bonus in. And then that's a wrap for If Underfell. If you guys like this series and want to see more of the If series, be sure to show your support. Seriously, it really does help and it helps motivate me to like really keep at it. I really need to get myself an editor though, because editing... Oh, it's so exhausting, especially when so much stuff is happening around me with like friends and family. So it's like very distracting and very daunting for me. All right, let's just get on with it, shall we? I think I've talked long enough. Oh, one last thing I should point out. In terms of like audio, I have no control how loud the character is. The character's audio and the background music, they're literally on one. So you only got one slider thing to control the volume, which is this here. And it's a hit or miss for me, so I'm sorry if you can't hear the characters that well. Okay, so where are we starting? We're going to start in Snowden when we first hear Papyrus, because that's where we find Papyrus. He comes running out of nowhere, you know? And on top of that, yes, I created a new sprite for Papyrus. It's a bit more appropriate than the original one, eh? Ah, uh, okay. Sans, there you are, you lazy. Now, in terms of did I do a good job at voicing Papyrus, I, I don't think I was too far off. I knew it was going to be like a gruffy voice, which it is. There is a loud voice ahead of you. You see a skeleton in red and black clothes marching across the snow-covered plains. Even at a distance, you can see he's tall. Taller than any human you've ever met. He strives across the snow with ease and stops short when he notices you. There is a good bit of distance between you and the new skeleton, but he is close enough that you can see his appearance. He has semi-close eyes with two scars on his right eye and sharp teeth like sands. He wears a red scarf cape, a pointed black shirt, black trousers, and long red gloves. Looks... He looks like best friend material to me. Sorry for missing our meetup, time boss, says Sans, his tone a touch nervous. You notice there's beads of red, glistening sweat on his skull. I was escorting this human. I can infer as much, Sans. Hello, human, says the skeleton. You introduce yourself with a smile. The skeleton tilts his head. A human who knows basic manners will Sans actually tell a funny joke next. Sans immediately protests at that. Hey! Human, I will give you the honor of knowing my name. 
I am the great papyrus of the royal guards. It is my duty to capture or kill all humans who trespass into our kingdom. At least he does clarify he can either capture or kill depending on like if he feels it's necessary. I like the fact that he does say capture or kill, not that I must capture every human, like there's no other option. At least he's willing. That's not good for you. You considered how to respond. Well, to be fair, it's not like he said he would 100% kill you. He technically gave you an option. His option were to capture or kill. So, half of it's okay, if I'm honest. You can at least talk your way out of one of them. You'd be dead as a dodo with the other. Papyrus does not give you much time. Human, you have caught me at a good time. Oh, does that mean he won't try to kill you? His expression lights into that of amusement. <laughs> Don't be a scene. Instead, I will give you a choice. Surrender here and now and I will capture you instead of killing you. Or you may try to proceed and die in a horrible manner by my traps. And here, of course, my character ends up doing something that is not technically me. I would be like, you know what? Death sounds a lot better for me. Or just capture me and take me now. Traps. Like puzzles? Yes, human. Oh, you love puzzles. You enthusiastically agree to try out the puzzles. And I'm just like in the background like, no. Everybody hated the fog maze. Oh, Sam stares at you dubiously. What? Seriously? What's wrong with you? Yes, you were so disappointed that none of the puzzles were in the ruins. How dare that vandal who dared, you know, mess with those puzzles? How else is everybody else supposed to face them and, you know, near, have near-death experiences if somebody else has triggered them? It's hard to get a read on Papyrus' mood. His face is difficult to read and his body language is standoffish. Your guard, however, tells you he feels hesitant, uncertain, perhaps even unsettled. Understandable, why would a human be excited about traps that could kill them? Unless they got a death wish. These are not toys, human. They will kill you. Maybe, or maybe not, regardless, it's better than fighting Papyrus now, and who knows, these puzzles might be fun! Ah, uh, if only I was given a choice when it came to, like, under swap, you know. I'd be like, ah, hey, you know what, Sans? <laughs> just capture me, just take me now, I don't want to face your maze. But instead, the bunnies had to, like, I literally had to go in and help the bunnies. Papyrus smiles at you. It doesn't look sincere. You wonder to yourself if he's putting on a front. Very well. How could I refuse such enthusiasm? Come here, brother. Mm, okay, boss, says Sans. He was a bit of a pirate, so it's sparing you another look, but it's probably thinking you've literally gone insane or have taken shrooms at some point. Stop calling me boss. Mm, okay, boss. Sans! Papyrus' fists clench into fists. He looks away from Sans in disgruntled disgust. Are you prepared, human? You dreamingly beam. Yes, yes you are. You can do this. The idea of getting to conquer monster puzzles fills you with determination. Gah, Sans. It's okay, Papyrus. This isn't a horror tale. It's okay. Ah, but determination keeps coming back all the time. Nee. Can you please stop traumatizing my brother? Nee. If you know what that was a reference to, you're welcome. If you don't... Go check out the horror tale. Alright. Filled with determination, you tell Papyrus that you are ready. This first puzzle is one I only recently added, says Papyrus. You see the space between us. There is a trap buried underneath the snow. Any non-magical living creature who steps onto the trap will be shockingly unhappy. <laughs> now when he says shockingly unhappy, he technically is referring to the fact it shocks you, right? Papyrus laughs to himself. It's an infectious laugh that you can't resist smiling from. How can you cross something like that? Flabby's voice is drenched with worry. Do not worry, human. I am a monster with integrity, but it wasn't even the human who said that I was technically flowy. But still, all of my puzzles have solutions. Even for creatures like you, there is a path where the trap will not activate. For this puzzle, all you must do is find that path. Papyrus drags a foot along the snow in front of him to create a line. If you can reach me here, you will succeed and I will allow you to move on to the next puzzle. Simple enough, you can do this. Okay, so I'm going to go and do his puzzle and you guys don't really need to see this puzzle again for like the umpteenth time. So I'll be back once we're done. So of course, after you've 
you know, completed his wonderful maze. You crossed the line drawn in the snow. You did it. You made it through the puzzle. Wow, says Sans. First try beginner's luck, eh? Twinkle is very smart, Flowey loudly says behind you. Well done, human, says Papyrus. You smile. Papyrus's eyes narrow. Do not get cocky, human. God help us all when we get to the point where, like, we have to do this with, like, horror tale Sans. He will not be convinced. If I each do a reset during that game, and if he doesn't call me out on my malarkey, I will be very surprised. Let's see. You say you're looking forward to the next puzzle. Then tell, then let us not dally. Come here, human. The next puzzle was put together by my brother. Oh. Go, Sans, looking uncomfortable. Papyrus notices immediately. What is wrong, brother? Uh, well, you see, boss, I've been meaning to set up, really. I just didn't find the time. What do you mean you didn't find the time? All you do is sleep or drink at Grillby's. If you spent half a fraction of that time, you spend loafing around on your puzzles. Papyrus stomps the ground, the red gleam in his eyes brightening, and Sans winces from Papyrus's lecture. You offer to wait for Sans to put the puzzle together. Papyrus lets out a very loud sigh. No, no, then we would be here all day. Let us simply move on to mine. You agree. You say you're looking forward to the next puzzle. Papyrus gives you an indescribable look. You can't tell if he's dubious of your claim or please. You hope he's pleased, because you have a thing for that skelly. You cross the plains and decide to walk between the two skeletons. There are many dead trees on the outskirts of the plains, along with patches of ice that is difficult to walk. But Paris and Sands remain completely unbothered by the train. Either skeletons can use magic to make their journey easier, or they simply are accustomed to it. Probably both. You look around as you walk. There's not much to see aside from the snow, ice, a cave ceiling, and dead trees. After some minutes of trekking through the snow, you can start to feel your toes go numb. You think it would be nice to get out of the snow soon. What do you mean? There's two other things you can look at. You can look at the sands, or you can look at the dashing tall skeleton that you are trying to woo in this one. I mean, he's literally not fully clothed. You can see his spine. I'm just saying, there is something to look at. Hello. Tall and handsome over here. My character's like, oh, there's just trees, the ceiling you know stuff not the handsome skeleton that we're trying to woo in this romance round no my character's priority is snow dead trees and ceiling <sighs> you are not like some of the others that knew exactly what they wanted and they were very forward with what they wanted my goodness some of them were a bit uh, a bit spicy anyway after minutes of trekking through the snow you can start yeah um it is then you spot a wooden bridge, and on the other side of the bridge you can see the buildings. A town! Stay here, human, says Papyrus, as he and Sans cross the bridge. I mean, at least we're well behaved enough to, like, stay perched and not just run forward. You take the time to inspect the bridge. It covers a chasm between the forest and the town. The chasm stretches to your right and left as far as the eye can see. You wait for them to cross. Once Papyrus and Sans arrive on the other side of the bridge, Papyrus awards you with a smile. Your manners have impressed me, human. You are the first of your kind to do so. That surprises you. Were the other humans not polite? Your question makes Sans and Papyrus laugh. Ha <laughs> good joke, red and pink eyes, Sans laughs. The humans I have encountered would normally attack on sight, says Papyrus, all start acting hysterically. Sobbing, screaming, pleading was embarrassing to watch, sneers Sans. Oh, uh, you know, it's unco how uncomfortable, because I mean, it was uncomfortable. Just imagine, they're like, oh, please don't hurt me. me. <laughs> they're like, we haven't done anything to you yet. Why are you crying? But as you have remained civil company, I will give you a chance for the honor to face me, says Papyrus. If you can make it across the bridge, you don't want to fight him. Wait, what's wrong with the bridge? Good of you to ask, human. You notice Papyrus has his hand on a pedestal at the end of the bridge. He pulls out a red crystal from the pedestal and the bridge disappears. You and Flowey gasp. I'm surprised Flowey gasped. Was, like, Flowey's been here for, like, ever, right? Has Flowey never, ever noticed that there is a magical crystal inside the bridge that can be taken out at any intervals? Has he never, ever seen that? We know people have gotten to Papyrus. Because Sans told us the Papyrus has actually faced humans before. 
Has he never gotten them up to the point of the bridge then? Have they all technically met their end during the first puzzle with him? Were they really that bad that they couldn't get through the maze? I'm assuming they couldn't get through the electrical maze then at the start. But Sans did say that some of them did make it past. So how come Flowey's never... How come Flowey's just as surprised as us about the crystal then? That's the one thing I don't understand. Has he like never noticed it? Yeah, because Flowey would have been at Asgore's place, right? So we had to travel from the castle all the way here, right? To get to the ruins where we find him. So he did he seriously never see the freaking... The, the, the crystals? Ever? Not once? Oh, yeah, because he can travel under the ground, can't he? Surely he went across the bridge. How else did he travel? The mystery of Flowey thickens, I swear. This is a magical bridge. It will only exist so long as it has magic. Papyrus hoists the crystal into view. This is the crystal that surprised that magic. Papyrus places the crystal back onto the pedestal. The wooden bridge reappears. I will ask you a question. If you answered correctly, you may advance. If you don't, I will remove the crystal and you will fall to your death. You take a glance at the chasm between you and the village. You may, of course, refuse the challenge. Another snowstorm is due tonight, so you will likely freeze to death if you remain out here. Paris laughs. <laughs> not much of a choice, is it? No, no, not really. This bridge is the only way into Snowden. This is, that is actually not entirely true. There is another way into Snowden. And he's standing right next to Papyrus. He's standing right there. He's the other way in. He can get you directly in if he wants. And it, is it seriously there's only one way into Snowden? But that's not in, Surely, where does the river... Okay, th there's another question I have here. I know it's not technically relevant to this situation, but the river person... Uh, the river... It's clearly a river, right? So it's all like the other side of Snowden, the, the river person, you could travel with them. This The freaking river does go downstream. Where does that go? Does that go like down a waterfall or something? Is that what it is? Does it go to the bottom of the chasm? Surely there's another way into Snowden. Without said magical bridge. <laughs> oh well. If we're in... Um, yeah, if we're in Slumber Hotel, there is another way. It's called flying. <laughs> anyway. Uh, let's see. This bridge is the only way into Snowdown, says Papyrus. The, your only way is forward. Either freeze to death from inaction, fall to your death from stupidity, or die by my hands in battle. Or technically, still make it across the bridge. You know, do a couple of things where you nearly die from stupid decisions and still have to face me in battle. And die. Multiple times. The choice is yours! None of those options are appealing. But you think at least one of those choices can be changed. You take a step onto the bridge and give Papyrus a grin. You are filled with determination. Gah! Human. Sorry, Reaper Sans. Sorry, Reaper Papyrus. You will take on his challenge. And you will win! So I'll be right back once we do his challenge. So of course, after we have successfully done the the puzzle thing for him, congratulations human, you have the bare minimum of intelligence needed to fight me, says Papyrus, technically calling you not very smart, but that's okay. You thank Papyrus for the weird compliment, even though technically he's partially calling, like literally saying at least you've got a bit of intelligence, as you're not entirely stupid. But that still remains to be seen, because my character still does dumb things. You think he's happy for a moment, and then his smile drops. His posture shifts to stand offish again. He clears his throat. I will let you pass. You may visit Snowden for your final meal. I'll be waiting for you at the end of the town. If you keep me waiting for too long, I will hunt you down. So do not dally, human. It's nice he's letting you pass now. That's one step closer to being... To smooching him. Smoochy smooch. The thought of it fills me with... Determination. Gah! I didn't even say it fully, Papyrus. Gah! Poor Papyrus. Papyrus waits for you to reach the end of the bridge. And as soon as your feet touch solid ground, you are instantly relieved. Welp, enjoy your stay, red and pink eyes, says Sans. He waves goodbye to you as he leaves. 
We made it to Snowden, Twinkle, says Flowey. Yes, yes you did, and you enter Snowden. Bum, bum, bum. We'll be right back once we are up against Papyrus. Now, let us go and face Papyrus. Your boots crunch into the snow-covered road, and you can see Papyrus at the end of the village. You feel much warmer after spending time in Violet's shop, and Flowey hugs you back. Are you ready? Flowey asks you. Yes, you are. You are filled with... <laughs> oh, Papyrus. Oh, I'm going to need a vacation. <sighs> Papyrus, what am I going to do with you? I don't know, brother, but can you deal with the human that keeps coming back from the dead all the time? If they keep doing it, I will. Okay, now let us get into it. Let's face Papyrus. Papyrus is standing behind you. And between you and the only way out of Snowden. You can do this, Flowey whispers encouraging you. Yeah. Yes, you can. There's a thrum of warmth inside of you and you can feel your soul reacting to the battle. Its white light illuminates the world around you and Papyrus stares at you. Enjoy the final meal, human. Papyrus asks you his gaze focused on your soul. Sadly not, because we never got to eat anything. It's time I, the great Papyrus, will defeat you here and now, human. As the strongest member of the Royal Guards, I will not fail. You will die to here, human. Papyrus holds out a hand to you. Step forward and meet your demise. You tell Papyrus you don't want to fight, but it's not like we really have much of a choice, you know? Teach their own and their decisions. You don't have a choice. If you will not come to me, I will hunt you down. Or technically, he will insta-kill me. You take a step forward and tell Papyrus you have no intention of hurting him. That's good, because you won't have a chance. The ground rumbles between your feet. At least you died in battle, human. That is the only mercy I know. Fair enough. I mean, that's okay. Uh, <sighs> it's considerate of him. The ground rumbles between your feet and you look down. You only have a second to register the orange glow when you suddenly have no vision. So, it's pain between your eyes and you've died. Well then. You tell the pirates you don't want to fight. Okay. You don't have a choice. If you will not come to me, I will hunt you down. Hold on, this feels like deja vu. You take a step forward again and tell Papyrus with no intention of hurting him. That's be good because you won't have a chance. You anticipate the bone beneath you and quickly step back. Your eyes widen in surprise. Where you once stood now is a glowing orange bone and you realize this must be what impaled you before. Congratulations, human. You were fast enough to survive the first move. Said Papyrus, you cannot tell if he's being sarcastic or not. You thank him anyway, and he tilts his head. His red eyelids grow dully inside his eye sockets. Hmm, remaining polite will not get you far, human. As a member of the Royal Guards, I have a duty to kill you. Words will not dissuade me. How about flirting? Just imagine you go into this fight and you flat out just from the start. Make your intention known. Flirt from start to finish with him. How flustered he's going to get. You tell him you didn't want to fight him. I can clearly see that, but... You barely see an orange dot in the peripheral of your vision before you feel something slam into the side of your head. Your whole body goes numb and tingly, except your head. Your head is on fire. The pain is so intense you want to scream, but you cannot. Lose something, human. Don't make a joke out of it, Papyrus. You literally took my head off. That's a bit disturbing, but also... Damn, instant karma. Does anybody recognize what he did there? He got vengeance for Papyrus because what goes around comes around and it literally did. Papyrus takes your head off instead of you taking his head off when you go down genocide. A nice callback. You see the top of your head slide off in front of you. It hits the ground before you finally die. Can't hold that one against him. Okay, so you bend backwards to avoid the next attack after doing that all over again. An orange bone pierces the air where you were. You take another step back and Papyrus seems to frown. Your reactions are better than I expected, human. I'll have to step it up. Oh dear, that sounds like you'll need to focus now. You brace yourself for the ongoing, oncoming attacks. The ground rumbles beneath you and you remember from your earlier death what that means. You jump out of the way as several orange bones shoot up from the snow-covered earth. 
Through the corner of your eye, you see orange dots, and you duck without thought. You dodge three more attacks, but you are a smidgen too slow for that abrupt barrage. Lovely. You dodge three more attacks. Yeah. In rapid succession, you are impaled by several separate attacks. One in your leg, one in your arm, one in your gut, one in your shoulder, and one in your lungs. Tearing, burning, burning, dilapidating pain fills you and your mouth fills with blood as you drown in your own fluids as you do. You cannot speak, you cannot make a noise from low gurgles as you choke and die slowly. I don't want to do this, human. Why did you come here? I... It's a long story short, I came here to woe with skeleton, a.k.a. you, handsome. But, do you know, for real reason, this... What can I say? This dummy. <sighs> this dummy. That's all I'm gonna say. But, uh, truthfully, my main reason for coming here is to win your heart, dear skeleton. Soul and all. Meaning, I'm not going anywhere until you love me. And you will love me. Gosh, I sound like Fluttershy with, like, all the little animals where she's like, You will love me! <laughs> During, like, the gala scene. <laughs> oh, Fluttershy. Oh, God. You're all forward to avoid the barrage this time. It is a frantic and thoughtless move to avoid the barrage. Unfortunately, in your panic to not die painfully again, you put too much effort into your role. I'm sorry. You roll directly into an awakened bone that impaled you like a knife and butter and you've died. And at least Papyrus is apologizing. Unlike someone. <coughs> Sans. <coughs> you apologize after the fact. Papyrus at least apologized. Before me having to do anything to him. Okay, so I'm gonna, of course, skip over dialogue that we've already seen. Okay, you roll forward to avoid the barrage and pop back up before you hit the next attack. You offer him a small smile and say so you don't want to fight, and Papyrus steps back from you, his hands clenched into fists. It does not matter, human! I have to do this in this world, it is kill or be killed! You disagree and you tell him you don't have to fight. Ha! He scoffs. You tell him neither of you have to fight. And what would you suggest? Papyrus snaps at you. I let you go and what? You will die anyway. You are not. Or, well, you won't stay dead, but you're not going to tell him that. You offer him a smile. You won't die and neither will any monster. You don't want to hurt anyone and you think Papyrus feels the same. You want to show him mercy and you ask he does the same to you. Absurd. Show a human mercy? Mahaha. <laughs> Papyrus throws his head back and laughs. It feels false, though. I am the great Papyrus. I have the highest count, human. Actually, you don't. Sounds put you to shame, but still. Do you understand what that means? It means that I have captured and killed more humans than any other royal guard. It's all I do. It's all I can ever do. But the thing is, you never did that before, though. Surely you didn't. You didn't, like, become a royal guard the day you were born, Papyrus. There was stuff before that. You can become a cook. You can be my lover. You can be a cuddly skelly. You don't have to do this. You disagree and remind him about his puzzles. Puzzles to trap and kill humans! Regardless of the intentions, they were nice puzzles. They have similar things on the surface, minus the lethality. He shakes his head fiercely. Stop trying to dissuade me, human. You will die, if not by me, by someone else. You don't... You won't die, and he doesn't have to fight you. He hesitates. Why are you trying so hard, human? Because I want to be more than your friend. I want to be your lover. I, you... What? You repeat yourself. You mean like best friends? No. Well, yes, but also no, that's part of the process. I do not understand. I tried to kill you repeatedly. You don't seem angry. Papyrus shifts his weight uneasily. It's hard to read the expression, but you get the stink feeling. He's uncomfortable. Remorseful? You remind him that you're alive now. But I... Uh, do you not think I'm capable of it, human? No, 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 you are quite sure he could kill you. In fact, he has done so. However, you also think he could not kill you. You think the two of you could become something wonderful. Something wonderful? Papyrus mulls over your words. Yes. I have been told having a best friend. Oh dear, it looks like he's going to keep having misunderstandings. Okay, you waste. Okay, do we want to, like, okay, you, red face and shy, you try to clarify. With the adrenaline of the battlefield fading, you find yourself having to rely on your normal confidence. That is not good. You make odd gestures with your hands as you try to get the words and your face burns. You almost wish you were in a life or death situation again so that you could think clearly. Why are things easier when your life depends on it? It takes a few minutes, but you do get the point across. 
I, 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 I do not know you, human. Papyrus says I cannot replicate your feelings. That's okay. That's what dates is for. Oh, of course. That's only if he's okay with giving you a chance, is he? Papyrus thinks it over. Very well, human. I will give you a chance. Stay alive, and we will go on a date. Be grateful, human. I'm sparing you for now. A burst of happiness inside you gives you the confidence to reach forward and hug Papyrus. Oh. If my character was more confident, she'd be like, you know what, just just come down here, come closer, come closer. I've got something special to tell you. Mwah! And then kisses the scallion and he'll be like, yeah, human, no. He stiffens immediately at your contact and his cheeks burn, but you persist. If you can handle dying a few times, you can handle hugging your crush. It takes him a solid time, minutes of processing what you've done before he starts to awkwardly pat your back. A uh, human, are you broken? You tell him this is what friends and possibly maybe hopefully couples would do. I see. Papyrus hesitantly hugs you back. Yay, you did it. You survived Soden and made a friend who might one day be your boyfriend. Is this normal? Papyrus asks Flowey while he hugs you. Yeah, says Flowey. Strange. Yeah, agrees Flowey, but at least he doesn't have like a proper issue of Papyrus compared to what he does with Sans. It's time to leave Snowden. You're currently remote sing Papyrus, you hope you can get that date! Okay, well, I will be back once we find our wonderful skeleton romancy here. I will be back shortly. Alright, we're in this city, and once we enter the city, everyone must have any issues because I'm a stinky human. Let's see. What the uh, thrills a voice? You and the two guardsmen are approached by a group of monsters ranging from a cat-like monster to a mini-volcano monster and several bat-like monsters. The cat monster growled. You're letting a human go? What if it attacks us? If I wanted to attack you, I would have done so. Humanity is our enemy, agrees the volcano monster, says the volcano monster, who literally is a hypocrite because volcanoes are dangerous to humans too. They are natural disasters. You know, a lot of them are going off nowadays. We can't trust it. Arrest it at least. Arrest me for what? Breathing the same air as you? Walking through town? I didn't attack anyone. I didn't do anything. I literally just walked through town and apparently there was enough to trigger everyone. Eh? Gosh, it's like being on Twitter. Oh, sorry. Being on X. Oh, gosh, it sounds terrible. Twitter was better sounding than X. So now I keep thinking of Sonic X. That is enough. The guards straighten up and the civilians immediately flinch. Papyrus strides towards your group from behind the civilians. They immediately separate, each clambering to move his way. The guardsmen salute to Papyrus when he arrives. Papyrus's eyelids waver as he assesses the group as a whole. His expression is, as always, difficult to read, but you think he seems annoyed. Nonetheless, you are happy to see him. You give him your warmest, happiest smile. Papyrus smoothly steps in front of you and turns around to address the group. This human is with me. Disperse. There is a moment of hesitation as Papyrus' back is turned to you. You cannot see his face when he growls. Now. But you do see everyone visibly wince. The civilians scurry away. And the guards left after saluting Papyrus. Papyrus turns to you. He folds his arms across his chest as he haughtily looks down at you. We have unfinished business, human. Oh, you did not have a final meal at Snowdin as per my orders. To be fair, I couldn't because as soon as I entered Grillby's, off went my head. How is that my fault? You should technically take it up with Sans. Literally, I couldn't go in there. All the guards were in the in Grillby's. I couldn't go in there to have a meal even if I wanted to. Literally, I got my head taken clean off. What am I supposed to do? He says, therefore I will watch you have it here to make sure you follow through this time. Oh, your face burns as if you're back in Hotland. You try to ask if it's a date. Papyrus closes his phone. To your bewilderment, you see a light dusting of red under his eye sockets. Call it what you want. Let us go, human. It is a date. Congratulations, you finally got your date with the Smexy skeleton. Oh Papyrus is a fast walker due to his height. Each step covers a long distance. He moves quickly as he walks monster. 
He moves quickly as mons- as he walks. Monsters scramble to get out of his way. It's an odd thing to watch. You don't understand their urgency. It is nice of them to move for him, but the speed behind their movement speaks of a certain level of fear. Um, that was not at all present in the monsters from Snowden. When they talked about Papyrus, the children revered him. Yeah, the children love him. You know he's capable of being dangerous, but you also knew that is not a natural inclination. Yeah, he's, you know, he's a sweetie. After all, you died against him. Each up against him, your soul brushed against his soul. You know he's killed two humans before and captured 20 others. Even if he did not directly kill the other 20, he indirectly led them to their deaths. Perhaps they were used to test experiments like Nathaniel was. Papyrus didn't strike you as ignorant or slow-witted. He must know what happened to those humans and it's weighed on him. He doesn't want to hurt others. He doesn't want to hurt anyone. At least you died in battle, human. That is the only mercy I know. I don't want to do this, human. Why do you come here? I'm sorry. These three messages linger in your heart for they felt the sincerest from his soul. Well, yeah, because he didn't want to do this. He's certainly forced to do this by Asgore. And the only mercy he knows is through battle, which is true because even if he shows you mercy... What, what then? If you bump into anything else that thinks you're a threat, monsters, so on and so forth, you're dead. The only mercy he can technically give you is death. But of course, we're, we're lucky or stupid enough to survive most of this because we have the power of reset, aka we have a cheat button. He's not a bad person. In fact, you think he'd be kind if he felt he was allowed to. He is. He's very kind. He's very sweet. He's a sweetie. It's a terrible thing when a kind person has to do unkind things. The weight in his soul is heavy. Human, you are too slow, says Papyrus. He stopped to allow you to catch up, and you mumble an apology. Hmm. Papyrus offers you his hands. We will walk at your speed. How kind of him! You appreciate it! That's the mark of a gentleman! Oh my, and he's willing to hold your hand in public? Oh, how cute! I am a magnificent and honourable monster! Papyrus confiscated guys. I know how to escort someone! No, 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 you don't know just how to escort someone. You know how to escort a lady. Ooh, bonus point! Ooh! You take his hand. His red gloves are cool to touch, and his fingers are much longer than yours. You've always been on the small side, but next to a Paris makes you feel petite. You like it. You hope your palms don't start to sweat. Your heart feels pleasantly tight in your chest as nervous butterflies dance inside you. You realise you very much like holding hands with him. Papyrus marches your pace as the two of you start walking. You don't know where to go, so you have to allow him to tag on you in one direction or another. After some walking, the two of you arrive at your location. It is a building partially built into the cave wall. Its walls are a deep midnight blue and its windows are tinted violet. There's signs about the door that read Requiem. Papyrus lets go of your hand. You frown at that. He opens the door for you and you hurry inside. Again, the mark of a gentleman! Oh my! You weren't expecting the flowers. The restaurant was awash in cool blue greys and purples. There was a black stone fireplace crackling with azure flames. There were dozens or so small tables with black covers and a plush dark blue seat that look tantalisingly comfy. There are pillars scattered between the tables that are covered in green vines that stretch up and envelop the ceiling. It is the ceiling that takes your breath away. It is an intricate web of violet, of viney violet blue flowers. The flowers cover the ceiling entirely and descend the walls and pillars. As you walk, the flowers above bloom into your presence and tiny wisps of white light are released from their centres and hover around them. A.K.A. That is the lights. The only provide minimal light so the entire restaurant is dimly lit. Cosy. It is also, you notice, only you and Papyrus. This is a lot more intimate than you expected. You wonder if Papyrus can hear how loud your heart is beating right now. A monster emerges from beside the fireplace. There must be a corner there that you can't see and greets both of you with a white toothless grin. The monster is barely taller than Sant and has the characteristics of some kind of spotted lizard. Their skin is a smooth black with electric blue spots and their eyes are closed. Yet their head is pointed directly at the two of you. He's wearing a white chef uniform with a black apron tied around their waist. They say... 
Puppy! I knew I smelt you. Who is your warm-blooded friend? Chef Kagoa! Papyrus greets with a smile. Anyone who can make Papyrus smile like that instantly puts them in yoga books. You beam at Kagoa, although you do not know if they can see it. This is my human, Papyrus says. Human, introduce yourself. You politely introduce yourself. His human? Oh, your heart is beating miles a minute. He just declared you are his. Oh, he's already got ownership. He says it so brazenly that you can't tell if he knew the implication of his words. Does he? Or maybe not. Or does he? Either way, your heart is suddenly mimicking the sensation of being electrocuted to death. Again. Except it also feels good because those giddy little butterflies are doing a cheer routine in your tummy. Yay! 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 Your tongue is tied as you do your best to introduce yourself while Chef Gagoa smiles. Cause I smell what's going on here. Papyrus sighs. Yes, yeah, Chef Kagoa, it is true. I have spared a human. Now I have granted them a final meal before they leave. Chef Kagoa's head swims left to right as he looks at Papyrus and you. Uh-huh. Papyrus clears his throat and you notice his skull is a tight shredder than before. As he says, that is all, Chef. Thank you for opening today. Well, I had to, didn't I? Chef Kagoa retorts and he flicks his tail. You sounded... Adorably abashed. I did not. You did. <laughs> the chef dismisses, calling Papyrus out straight away. He extends a hand to you and you accept it. He beams down to sniff your hand. I knew it. You were even holding hands. Uh, that is irrelevant, chef. Also, please stop smelling my human. Papyrus's voice is starting to sound high pitcher than normal. We will take our seats now. Thank you. Uh -huh. was all the chef said. He turns away and heads down the hallway beside the fireplace and Papyrus clears his throat. His skull is almost as red as his gloves. Oh dear, now you can feel your own face heating up to match. The two of you fidget shyly, or you think it's shy on Papyrus's part. You're not confident about it because why would he be shy? He's so cool. Until Papyrus takes a step out to one of the tables. He pulls back a seat and gestures for you to sit. You do, almost tumbling over yourself in the process. Papyrus takes a seat across from you. You worry if you'll be comfortable. It's a low seat and low chair. And he has long legs. But to your astonishment, as soon as he sits down, the floor sinks down several levels just in front of his chair. The table height didn't change. There's just now a deep divot in the floor for Papyrus to comfortably rest his feet. Papyrus notices your gaping expression. Is it not normal for human restaurants? You shake your head. Sounds uncomfortable for tall and powerful people like myself, he says. You nod. Humans have different tables and chair heights to compensate for that, though. No, wick around. I see, he says. Tell me, what is human food like? Oh, where to begin? You tell Papyrus about the cuisine on the surface. There are some foods he recognises. Burgers, pastas, cakes and others he does not. Pizzas, hot dogs, dumplings, tacos. So excitedly he asks you more questions. You answer each of them and ask questions in turn. Humanity's cuisine are not as clearly defined by culture as they used to be since the Great War. The remaining countries have melted together like cheese in a fondue pot. There's little distinction. Some families try to keep the culture alive, but most are happy to meld together. You explain you grew up with a unique culture that you strive to maintain. Uh, your family never ended in the... Yeah, we'll just keep it like that. The fusion was more apparent in food. Papyrus explained to you that this is also the case for Enderfowl. Before we were sealed, Papyrus explains, there used to be monsters exchanges between the kingdoms. We would trade scholars, chefs, warriors, and many more with our allies so that we could learn and grow. Papyrus's red gaze moves to the fireplace. We are, we are stagnant here. It's been decades since someone thought of something new to eat. Your brow creases. It does not help, he continues, that we are restricted with what we can grow and raise. There are only so many combinations with limited ingredients. He shifts in his seats and folds his hands together. He asks you, do you have a favourite food? You do, it's... And his red eye lights glow brightly. That sounds delicious. You say it is. Maybe. Papyrus sits forwards. His hand is outstretched and about to grab yours when suddenly... Here you are, Papi and Cutie. So Chef could go, damn it, Chef. You interrupted a moment of us, like, bonding over food. As we said, food is the way to a man's heart, apparently. Ask a boy's heart. 
Why are you feel a pang of disappointment? You're also excited to try monster food. Okay, you're still pretty disappointed. Hopefully Papyrus will grab your hand later. To a light, Papyrus grabs your hand. Your eyes widen in joyous surprise, even as you both blush. Chef Kakoa places two seeming plates in front of you and Papyrus. His tail then places two tall drinks. Enjoy, says Chef Goa. Also, I may be blind, but I still have good hearing. And these walls are thin, so... Chef! Papyrus squawks. Yes, yes, he says. Enjoy, enjoy, Twinkle. Do let me know if you can't eat any of this. It's been centuries since I last served humans. You look down. Not the food is recognisable, and it's glowing neon. You tell the staff you'll be happy to give it a try, as it looks positively magical. Oh, you're clever, he says. I like this one, puppy. Papyrus squeezes your hand and you squeeze him back. Yes, he says. Thank you, Chef Kagawa. Anytime. No big... In the kitchen, prepper for the week, he says. Chef Kagawa leaves the two of you. I notice that Chef Kagawa's accent keeps, like, changing for me. I never give him the same one. <laughs> Papyrus coughs into his hands and he looks back down at your intertwined hands. You seem upset earlier. I do not want any guests of mine to look distressed. That is the only reason I am doing this. You quietly tell Papyrus you like holding his hands with him. That is, um, good to know, he says. But we will need two hands to eat, so neither of you let go. Or we could try with one, I suppose, he says. Yes, that sounds like fun. You agree to do that. It's not easy, but that's what makes it fun. Some of the fruit requires being cut up, so you and Papyrus have to tag team it. Papyrus holds the knife with one hand and you hold the fork with another. Together you cut out the <laughs> neon blue thing that looks very really like a steak, but some of smells like squash. And then you have one piece ready for eating. You proudly hold it up to Papyrus to take the first bite. He's about to bend down to eat it. It is a silly affair, really, yet neither of you can stop smiling. You take turns feeding one another, and there are a couple of times where Papyrus pretends to miss your mouth, so he smears it on your cheek. You laugh, he laughs, he smiles, you smile. It's a delightful experience. Oh my god, this is so freaking cute! Ah! Oh my gosh, it's so adorable! <laughs> so cute! <sighs> I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. The food is nice. It is a strange sensation to literally feel food fizz away into nothing inside your stomach. Magical food is directly absorbed as energy. It does not pass through the digestive system, but not weird enough to dissuade you. There is a nice texture to the meal, and it's got a pretty, a perfectly balanced of flavour. It warms you from the inside out. It isn't like any recipe or dish you've had before. You try to think of anything that reminds you of it, yet nothing comes to mind. When the food is mostly eaten, you ask Papyrus about his relationship with Chef Kagoa. Why did the monster call Papyrus his protégé? When did he call him his protégé? Again, I'm going to ask this. Where was the dialogue where he says he's the protégé? Where was it? Did I miss it? There's no way I missed it again, did I? Where did he say protégé? Oh! says Papyrus in an uncharacteristically quiet voice. That is, that is because the chef taught me how to cook. Is Papyrus interested in cooking? I like it, he says. I'm good at it, like many things. You notice Papyrus is very talented. You praise him. And turns his head and coughs. The meal is over too soon. Okay. Alright, where were we? Okay. You want to linger. You want to draw it out. You want to spend more time with them. It seems to be against Papyrus's nature to dawdle, however. As soon as you are both done eating, he takes the plates away. And he disappears around the corner and re-emerges without breaking a stride. There, human, your last meal, says Papyrus. Good job on completing your order. You thank Papyrus as he guides you out of the restaurant. He wide hand rests on the small of your back. You're not sure if the skeleton monster has body heat, but you swear the spot feels like it's on fire. That's nice. Back on the streets, you wonder what will happen next. You look hopefully at Papyrus. Maybe you could ask him for a walk? Before you can, he's already speaking, and he removes his hand from your back. It's instantly cold without him, and you straighten up to his full height, and he says, You must leave Underfell now, human, and I must say, and I must stay. This is our goodbye. It surprises you how much that hurt your heart. The rush of disappointment is hard to ignore, but... You're not the type to give up. Now, are you? You disagree. 
either, either you could come back or... No, this is too dangerous, he says. So long as King Asgore says humanity is our enemy, you will always be in danger in Underfell. You should not put yourself in danger, not for me. You think he's worth the danger, and his demeanor shifts. There's a softness in his voice and posture that was not there moments ago. You are kind to think that. My, my, what do we have here? Coos a metallic voice, and Papyrus stiffens, understandably. He straightens up to his full height and steps between you and the voice. Metaton, what are you doing here? <clears throat> Hello, Papyrus, says the voice. You peek around Papyrus to take a look. The monster speaking looks like a humanoid robot. He has black hair that's been greased back, two pairs of yellow eyes and two sets of arms. He wears neon pink high, knee high spandex boots with heels and black spiky pants. He has a tall black shoulder pad and he wears neon pink and yellow gloves and has a broken hot belt around his waist. His smile is wide and reminds you of those news anchor smiles on TV. Not sincere, but not me neither. Metaton winks at you with one eye. All done talking to your human, do you mind if I take her? What business do you have? Papyrus brusquely asks. The human should be leaving shortly. I merely want to ask you some questions, Metaton says innocently. You don't mind, do you, darling? You shake your head. There, see, it's all perfectly innocent. You can even sit and watch if you want. Papyrus lids lower further into a glare. I will. How adorable! Meriton offers you a hand. Come with me. Papyrus coldly rebuts. Physical contact between humans and civilians are prohibited. But it's fine between a human and a royal guard, right? Eh? Eh? Meriton draws out in his voice. Chatrine, sweet. Yes, says Papyrus as he takes your hand. Yay! He has your hand again. I can restrain the human easier. Oh, you choose to focus on the fact that he's willing to hold your hand again and not too tightly either. Love it, says Metaton. You keep that up for the show, yes? Come, come. You and Papyrus follow Metaton. So I'm going to structure this one with like the the thing on TV with Metaton since it really drags out. I will, of course, do the first half where we first enter and then sit on the couch and then I'll skip over the part until we get to like the question of like who our character likes. Since this one tends to like drag on and I've done this one so many times. <laughs> you and Papyrus follow Metaton. Metaton guides you to a tall building with a bright pink neon sign that reads MTT. There are framed pictures of Metaton on each post and even a statue of his likeness is built next to another statue of a square robot with four arms. You are whisked inside, they are chillier than outside. It's also much brighter. You have become accustomed to that comfortable dim street light. I'm just gonna turn down this freaking music because this thing tends to get louder. Also keep in mind that while I'm recording this, the actual voice acting has been completely removed. So Papyrus is not gonna talk anymore from this point on. I'm gonna be talking for him. Sorry, but the original like recording I did for this section, it completely got corrupted, so I'm having to redo this one after the fact, so I'm so sorry. I didn't want to upload it with like, without it continuing, like having like the full thing in, so I'm so sorry. Not even uh, Asgore's gonna talk. Uh, awkward. Anyway. So the bright white lights inside momentarily blind you and you blink several times to help your red and pink eyes adjust. Metaton does not wait for you to adapt. He continues to usher you inside with a loud, Mind the step, darling, and you triple red. But Papyrus presses his other hand against your abdomen and pushes you back up. Once you are righted, he removes his hand from you and steps away. He folds his arm across his chest and says, You two... You must be honoured to have been escorted by me twice now. Oh, wait. <laughs> Why do I use Metaton's voice for that? No! <laughs> no! <laughs> that sounds so bad. What am I doing? Freaking Enderverse? <laughs> no! No, we're not in the world of freaking x -Tail. You must be honoured to have been escorted by me twice now, human. You are. He says he with an incredible poker face for a solid five seconds, then he turns red and looks away from you again. You, you match his expression and shyly look away. A metal clears his throat. 
Clear the floating for the cameras, please. Save the floating for the cameras, please. Cameras! To your surprise, you walk into a sad, specifically a talk show. So I'm going to, of course... Uh, read this part until we get to like the section where we start doing like the back and forth thing. I'll like only focus on parts of papyrus. Since this should have been up ages ago. I'm so sorry. I'm so behind. Keeping in mind as well I also need to um, shift over to my new laptop so that's gonna be fun. Hey. <laughs> oh. Anyway, oh yes, okay. There are two luxurious hot pink lounge chairs with yellow throw pillows at the center of the set. In between them is a black coffee table that blends in with the black tile floor. Kind of like a poor choice there with the table blending floor. Beside the chairs is a huge monitor that currently shows a silhouette of Metaton, and across to him reads a talking with Metaton. As I just said, you see a crew of monsters. There are many cameras, computer stations, and even a little buffet off to the side. And you recognize one of the monsters. It is Napsterbluk. You smile and wave at Napsterbluk, and the ghost mouth wobbles with the smile back, and you notice they have a pair of headphones on, and they are around several microphones. Maybe they manage the sound design. That sounds like a fun job. Welcome to my show, says Metaton. A Metaton, sir. One of the monsters approaches and gives you a wary look. Change of plans, says Metaton. Tea time is cancelled. There's a collective awes from the crew. Many hang their heads and you notice a few of them are wearing shirts with a picture of Metaton sipping tea and it reads Metaton knows all the tea. Well then. Oh my. We have something even better for tonight's show, says Metaton, our human. The arena is reserved by the Royal Guards this week. We can't host a death match, a bit like monster protest. We're not going to make the human fight. That's so boring, says Metaton. The monster looks at Papyrus in alarm, and one of them whispers loudly to Metaton. Sir, there's a Royal Guard right there. Yes, I know. I interrupted their date, snaps Metaton. You did not, Papyrus, sharply rebuts. What? Wait, what? Huh? This is literally the perfect news for tea time. Metaton claps slowly. We are not doing tea time. Everyone to their places. The show starts in a few minutes. Human darling, go take a seat. Human darling, go, go. Go and take a seat. Metaton looks papyrus up and down. You can stand by the cameraman, big boy. Hmm. <laughs> you sit in the plushy hot pink chair and you sink into it and you notice papyrus has moved to stand by the crew. His arms folded against his dress and you give him a smile and a wave. Metaton sits in the chair opposite of you and he crosses his legs and says, You must be dying to know why someone so famous as me has brought you here today. No, I do not. In fact, we're going to skip forward until we get to the question in which Metaton asks us, Who do we like? Alright, so here we are. So this actual episode is like way overdue, so let's just get on with it, shall we? So Metaton asks, Human, do you love anyone? Metatong glances slyly at Papyrus. Tell me, darling, is there anyone in Underfell that has caught your attention? You cannot stop yourself from immediately glancing over at Papyrus. Your heart jumps into your throat when you realise Papyrus is looking at you. Oh, my listening viewers, you are missing out. At our story studio today, we have the mighty Papyrus himself and this look between these two. Oh, Metaton looks like a cat who just learned how to work a can opener. Mischievously pleased. You bury your face in your hands. Ah, it is suddenly way too warm in here. Or is it just you? That is enough, Metaton, snaps Papyrus. If you are done with your question, the human must be going now. On a date with you, Metaton teases. What a tragic romance. I love it. There is no romance says Papyrus as he marches across the set, grabbing your hand and proceeding to drag you out. His skull is redder than a batch of strawberries. Toodles, thank you for coming. You shout your thanks back before Papyrus shuts the door behind you. It is quiet outside and Papyrus lets go of your hand. He keeps his back to you. He is quiet long enough that you decide to reach out to him. He steps away from you and turns around. His expression is difficult to read. Papyrus walks around you. He places his hand on your shoulder and turns you to face down one of the streets. Walk down this street, stay on this road until you reach an elevator. Hold on. You know, this music never suited this scene, if I'm honest. So hold on. Let's, 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 let's find some, like, much softer music. Absolutely not. 
Where's music when we need it? Does that sound like appropriate music for sadness? No. <sighs> Whatever. This is the best we can do. Walk down the street. Stay on the road until you reach an elevator. It will be a long walk for you and your short little human legs, he says. But do not stop. Take the elevator, go through the hall, and when you exit the hall, you will have a ride of the castle. You can avoid the king and go straight to the barrier behind the castle. Stay out of the throne room and you will be fine. You, he squeezes your shoulders. Go, human. You tried to turn around to face Papyrus, but his grip on your shoulder is too tight. He will not let you see him. Do not, he pauses, his voice becoming gentle. Do not be killed, Twinkle. Your eyes start to burn and you feel a lump in your throat. Papyrus lets go of your shoulders. You turn around quickly, but you only see a shimmer in the air and he's gone. It is only for you. It is only you and you need a moment to recollect yourself. Oh, and there he is. He's gone. Okay, so we're going to now skip forward to the next part where Papyrus is. So I'll be right back. Okay, so we're a little bit forward now. So we've just bumped into Undai and we asked Undai about the piece of paper we found, which is of course to do with Gaster. She then informs us that, yeah, she can't read that, but Sans and Papyrus can because, yeah, they're his brothers. Darn, you let me the fun that you hadn't thought to ask Papyrus when you were with him earlier. And I raised an eyebrow. You were with Pop earlier? You were. You asked him on a date. Wait, Metaton was lying about the romance? And eyes, yellow eyes bulge. Her mouth curls into a huge grin that shows off her sharp teeth. No shit, really? You happily tell you went on a date with him. She slung an arm around your shoulder, and she ruffles your hair laughing. <laughs> That's amazing. I can't believe that pompous skelly got a crush. Ha! <laughs> You're his first one, you know. This is great. Hey, you want me to come for you? We can tease him. You want to see Papyrus again, but you don't want to be a bother. No bother, no bother, she insists, and she pulls away from you and takes out her phone again. Her grin hasn't wavered. This is great. This, he will never live this down. She puts the phone up to her ear, and she only has to wait a few seconds until, Hey, Pops, guess where I am? I do not want to. You really should, she insists, and she mouths you. Laugh. You try to force a giggle. <laughs> It becomes easy to do when she pokes you in the side where you are unexpectedly ticket. You squeal with your laughter. Hear that? And die cackles. Why is the human laughing with you? Because I know how to have fun. Do you? And die relentlessly teases. I do! Papyrus loudly shouts with the phone. Stop bothering the human! And I only laughs in response. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Catch you later, dweeb. And I! And I hangs up and she grins at you. That was fun. All right, you, <laughs> Twinkle. I'll catch you later. I need to check up on Alfie. You smile. You look forward to seeing her again. Yeah, me too, she says. Take care of yourself, kid. It's time to leave the city. Okay, so we are still on Papyrus' route, so I will be right back when we head into the castle, get the necklace, and then we'll wrap it up with Papyrus' route for the last few scenes. BRB. Okay, now we have this scene here. This is after we fought Sans in Judgment Hall and we arrived at the castle. Upon arriving, we heard giggling. We followed this into a room and now we've entered the room. And of course, upon entering the room and having a look around, we suddenly feel a tug on our sweater. You look behind you, there's nothing there, and you frown. You feel something small and cold grasp your hand and you freeze. By the time you turn your head to look, you see nothing there. But there is something in your hand now, a golden locket. Your red and pink eyes widen as you realize that this is the locket to go with the chain. You pull the chain out of your pocket and sure enough, it perfectly fits with a clasp. Oh, how romantic. The locket feels out of style before you were born, fell out of style before you were born, but you've seen them in movies and read about them from books. They're supposed to be used to carry pictures of someone you love, or at least someone who's in your heart. It's a warm sentiment and you hold the locket in your hand. You can't help but think you'd like to see Papyrus inside. Oh, that would be lovely. Click! There is a clicking sound from the locket. You unfurl your hand and it pops open. A soft gasp escapes you. It's Papyrus. A beaming papyrus, one who looks overjoyed. Your heart warms and you hold the locket close to you. Your lips turn into a smile. 
How wonderful for you. How wonderful for you. You start from the whisper and you look around, but you don't see anyone. You, you thank them for the chain and the locket, and you think it's time to leave the most definitely haunted room now. So if you still are not aware of who this is, obviously at the start, there are graves and we are given the chain at the grave and then later on we're given the locket here. So I think it's pretty safe to say that Kara has been following us along the way. I mean, it would make sense, right? All right, now I'm gonna go beat myself up a goat and then we'll be back. All right, so here we are, the grand battle with the goat. You burst through the last volley on the barest hint of your sweater, touches the fire and it's seared off. Asgore spins his trident. Hm. You tell him you don't want to fight and you've told him this every freaking time you fought this bloody goat. That is not up to you, he says. Actually it is. It is your choice as it is his choice, but apparently he's too blind to see that at the moment. And he glares at you. You oversimplify this situation, disregard the truth. This is a kill or be killed world, he points to you. Your hands may not be stained red, but that is only by sheer luck. No, no, he snorts derisively. It is not by luck, it is by choice. It is by your determination. Gas and... It's okay, Papyrus, that's a different king. Ah. You will never harm someone. You unflinchingly meet his gaze. The past cannot be chained, but you in the present can. Asgore's eyes narrow. It is not a kill or be killed world. It is a save or be saved world. And that includes Asgore, even though I personally just want to kick his ass. You see the bearers flinch in his shoulders and he grips his trident tightly. You wax a nice tail. However, it is useless in reality. There is no hope for change, not for anyone. You shake your head. That's not true. And why do you think that? You give him a grin because he's already talking to you. If there truly was no hope, he never listened to you. And he's listening to you because he wants to be saved. You will send your hand to him. It's not too late. It's never too late. He can make peace now. He can lead his kingdom to the and give them happiness. <laughs> King Asgore looks at your hand with an unreadable expression. You... And then he stupidly raises trident and lowers his head because he decides violence over understanding. Fair enough. He will no longer meet your gaze. I cannot, he says. Goodbye, Twinkle. He conjures a second train and throws it at you, but it never touches you, thankfully. My hubby comes in. A wall of orange bones erupts from the ground and blocks the attack. Suddenly Papyrus is on your right side and Sand is on your left. Papyrus? Sands? King Asgore says slowly. Rare to see you shortcut, Papyrus. I think it's necessary, says Papyrus. Your Majesty, I must ask you that you do not attack this human anymore. You would go against me, Papyrus? The king quietly asks. I do not want to, says Papyrus. I do not want to fight anyone, your majesty. I do not want to hurt you, nor do I want you to hurt this human. For what reason would you go so far for her, King Asgwarth? I feel it is the right thing to do, says Papyrus. Nah, you're just crushing on her, Sans remarks. Sans, I swear to God if you don't shut up this minute. Shut up, Sans! Papyrus's voice is several notes higher and his skull turns red. I applaud your bravery, guardsmen, but you stand for the wrong thing, the king advises. Your feelings are fleeting. There is no hope for this. You are correct, says Papyrus. There is no hope if we do not try, as nothing will change. Preach it, Papyrus, preach it. I couldn't have said it better myself, Papyrus, says a soft voice. Because there's one thing Asgore cannot defeat, and that is Mamatori. Because hell have no fury like a mother. You and Asgore look on in surprise as Tori, the owner of the voice, marches into the room. The goat monster's golden eyes are burning with ferocity. She's not alone in a march. You see many monsters behind her. You see Froggy and Apsapook, the dogs from Snowden, Shiren, the children you met at the Warfall, Metatron and Staff, and the, guard, the royal guards with die at the lead. There's so many of them and they fill up the room and surround you all. Enough is enough! says Toriel. Tori? King Asgore says at her in blatant disbelief. You, you came back to me? No, she coldly rebuffs. I came for the human, for Twinkle's not all about you. She raises her chin and glares down at Asgore. And for monster kind, you take one step towards that human and you'll have to face me. 
and me. As Papyrus, the dogs howl in unison, each hold up a stick, and Sirens sing, Save or be saved. It's over, says Sans. He gives a sharp toothy grin. We're tired of this, so unless you want to have a hell of a time. King Asko looks at the monsters around him. Not only them, says a voice that feels familiar to you. The monsters part way to make room for a new monster. He's a goat monster with golden eyes and red pupils like Toriel and Asgore. Trailing behind him is none other than Dr. Alphys. Toriel gasps. Ezreal? Oh, um, <clears throat> hi, says Ezreal. I wasn't expecting to see you here, mother. Tori rushes to him and immediately hugs him. Ezreal? King Asgore's expression darkens to weariness. Is that truly you? It is. He says awkwardly patting Toriel back. I see you still haven't trimmed that awful beard of yours. Asgore eyes widen and he suddenly grins and strides forward. My boy! My son! One awkward family hug at a time. Ezreal complains. And besides, you were about to tell my friend. Friend? You look between Ezreal and Dr. Alphys. Wait, Flowey? Howdy, Twinkle, says Ezreal and he gives you a grin. Glad to see you're okay. Uh, you are okay, right? Yes, you run to hug him. Tori notices and opens up her arms to let you also hug Ezreal. Ezreal hugs you both. You seem a little singed. You sure you're okay? Yep. Good. Now, if you and mother will excuse me, I need to talk to father. Tori squeezes Ezreal and reluctantly lets him go. And you also let him go. Then he steps closer to his father, to King Asgore. Father, it is time this feud with humanity comes to an end. It is time the monsters return to the surface. Ezreal, no. Ezreal cuts him off. This isn't an argument or something up for debate. You won't win this. You can't win this. I understand. I understand the war changed you. I know those memories are hard to let go. But it's time. Don't stop us. Twinkle has shown us that humans and monsters can be friends again. Let us try. Asgore stares at Ezreal and he smiles faintly. I cannot win this. Good, because otherwise Ezreal's more than welcome to punch you again. He looks at you. Human. No, Twinkle. You said this world does not need to be killed or be killed. Do you truly believe that? You meet his gaze. Yes, yes, you do. You tried to tell him this before he suddenly raised his trident at you. It is not kill or be killed. It is save or be saved. And you smile at Asgore. And it's time for him to be saved now. Then so it shall be. He utters quietly and he drops his trident about bloody time. And while he is not smiling, you think he is happy. Now there's only a couple of things left to do. You pull Papyrus. He turns to face you. Yes, human. You tell me you need to check up on a friend. And you'll be back. Very well. Now, we're going to, of course, skip over the part where we talk to Gaster in the Void. So we'll be right back. All right. So after we have freed none other than um, Wingardings from the Void, we are now going to go with our friends and leave the underground. So together, you and your new friends leave the underground. You feel strong enough to walk as soon as you smell the fresh air, and Ezra gently sets you down. He keeps upon your shoulder in case you need help. Please allow me, says Papyrus, and he quickly comes to your side. Sands and Winger Dings close behind him. Ezra looks to you. Are you sure? You reassure Ezra it's okay. He gives you a friendly nestle. Okay, call me over if you need help. Papyrus offers his hand and you accept it. I am looking forward to trying your human cuisine, says Papyrus. Then how about they eat lunch together? They can do it one-handed again. One-handed? Asks Swingerdings. That is acceptable, says Papyrus, adjusting a red under his eye socket. Oh, look, Wings, our baby bro got his first date, mate. Coos, Sans. They grow up so fast. Teases Wingerdings. Shut up, you two! No. No, they say. Gah! Go back to fighting each other and leave us alone! Snaps Papyrus. No. No, they say. Poor, poor Papyrus. He's never going to hear the end of this. No, I'm not, and that's the worst thing. They're my brothers. I never get to hear the end of this. You smile, your own eyes burning. Yes, this is it. It's not a kill or be killed world. It is a save or be saved world. And you save them. Papyrus squeezes your hand and you look up at him. You tug on his hand and he leans down so you can whisper to him. You tell him you have something to show him. He lowers his voice. What is it, Twinkle? 
you tug on your locket. Oh, I recall... Papyrus clears his throat and lowers his voice again. It's surprising you have one, human. You tell him you have a matching one too. One for him. Papyrus tilts his head. Yes. You open your locket to reveal his face inside and you give him a shy smile. Papyrus' entire skull turns red. I... His voice cracks. I regret not bringing the camera, Sans remarks. Shut up, Papyrus snaps. He picks you up. And there's an odd sensation of being dunked into water and you lose your vision as the world swirls. You blink several times as Papyrus sets you down. You are back in Unterfell, specifically in the garden, now alone with Papyrus. I do not want to hear from them. We can leave once we've finished talking, he says. That sounds good. Human, he says, when you confess to me in Soden, I was not prepared for you to treat it seriously. But you have, and so I will answer you seriously. You brace yourself. I accept your feelings, he says. You beam. Happy butterflies are just all dancing in your stomach. Even if your heart is pounding so hard that you can feel it might burst out, you can't deny that you're ecstatic. Papyrus takes your hand and gives you a gentle smile. You really are happy? Of course. You really like me? Of course. Even though I, you reassure Papyrus that you really like him, what's in the past is in the past. You care about his present and future, and he squeezes your hand. So long as you are in my future, then I will strive to keep my face in your heart. He leans down and presses forward against yours. Thank you for liking me, precious human. True happy ending, Papyrus is right. Okay, so we're going to skip down here. It seems like everything is worked up for the best. Your journeys, your struggles, none of it was in vain. And you saved them, all of them. And you didn't make it alone. The Gastro family moved to the surface right next door to you and your new home as a VIP ambassador. You had to move into a magically secure home of your choosing in the city, but you and Papyrus see each other daily. The two of you spend every evening together in the kitchen. He wants to learn how to make every human food imaginable and he loves to hold your hand as often as possible. How can you say no? You love spending time with him in public. He is very vocal about his affections for you and the fact that the two of you are dating. He constantly refers to you as his date mate, dear human and precious love, and so on. <sighs> so cute. It makes you all warm and giggly every time he does, and you love it. While you're happy to have a boyfriend slash date mate, you make sure not to lose touch with your friends you've made. Most notably, Ezreal's become a huge part of your life. He became the new king of monsters and helps you integrate the two societies. You are dear friends at work and outside of it. He also gives the second best hugs. Papyrus, of course, is first in your heart. And you spend time with Tori and Asgore every so often. Tori bakes you a special pie and loves to give you hugs. You hang out with Ndai, you're semi-regular on the Medjitom's new show on the surface, and you attend all of Tyrone's concerts and are the first to buy her new album, Save or Be Saved. You visited the kit the school in the city where the monster kids started to attend and they enthusiastically introduced you to their new human friends though you did have to try and talk them out of jumping off of another waterfall with their new friends multiple times you meet up with all the dogs from snowden as well every month for a game of poker which you suck at a lot papyrus papyrus tries to coach you but his poker face is almost as bad as yours when he gets flustered which is every time you give him affection you are his weakness Everything is as it should be. Everyone is happy and you're the reason for it. Thank you, Twinkle. Thank you for falling into Underfell and thank you for showing them kindness. Thank you for staying determined and thank you for being you. The end. All right, and that is the long overdue wrap up for Papyrus's route. Keep in mind that technically this was meant to have like more voicing in it, but yeah, the original footage got corrupted so I had to go back and re-record it. And at that time, it the voicing had been removed all right okay i'm pretty happy to finally wrap up the if underfell series for now if indeed we get any more bonuses i will of course cover it but you know how this works 10 likes in the video and i will bring you another if video be it for if underfell or for any others in the series the next game we're of course heading off to deal with is none other than if Mafia fell into one of the other games gets updated. The one I'm looking forward to the most though to get updated is definitely Siren Call. That one has definitely been like my go-to fave so far um, that I adore. I'm also really excited to see more of If Horror Tale. Um, but yeah, I'm so sorry this one took so long. It was meant to be up ages ago, so I'm so sorry. 
stuff happen, but hey, better late than never, right? Let's just go and get this up, okay? Great, fantastic. We're never going to talk about this again. Right.